What's up, guys? Matthew here from The Art of Eating. We are back in my kitchen cooking with Walmart on tastemade.com. We have such a fun recipe for you guys today. It's December. It's been getting chilly. Nothing to me screams comfort food more than braised short ribs. Braised short ribs are so versatile. They're one of those things that can either take a couple of hours or you can let them take all day. Um, they are a tough cut, so we're looking for that nice low and slow braise. Um, with a lot of extra vegetal qualities and other fun things going on. So a lot of things going on today. I'm going to walk you through the different steps. I'm going to show you how to plate this up. I'm going to show you how to make a delicious batch of quick mashed potatoes as well, all in the midst of throwing this all together. We're going to take this step by step. Let's get started right off the bat, right? So I have a hot plate here that I'll be working off of, as well as doing some prep and mise en place in front of you on here. So we're going to turn this hot plate on to medium high or so, and I'm going to add just a few tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, just like that. I have some beautiful short ribs that I picked up from Walmart today. Look at the marbling on these guys. Look at that. Amazing. Love that. So I'm just going to give these guys a light season with some salt right on top to help bring out some of that moisture. It's also going to help us get a better crust while we are searing them in our Dutch oven. Now, the recipe that you guys may be looking at is actually going to call for six short ribs. Well, I didn't wanna do six short ribs all at once twice for the amount of time that we have for this video. I do have some on reserve later. I'll show you what I mean in a little bit about that. But we are having this recipe just for the sake of the equipment and everything that we have here. Uh, it'll also be a lot easier for you to see this in a smaller version rather than seeing it in a larger version. So I'm going to take some kosher salt and generously season the outside of our ribs, all sides. I'm not just browning that fat cap, I'm browning the entire thing. So all the sides, the bottom, that inlay where the bone is, all that kind of stuff, everything's gonna get touched with salt here. Nice, fatty, beefy short ribs. So again, since I'm not doing a complete recipe, rather than trying to have me do a bunch of mental math, I won't be saying all of the amounts as we are adding them as you have your own copy of the recipe. So you could follow along using that, no problem. Just gonna wash my hands, one moment. So while this pan's getting heated up a little bit, inductions work very fast. Uh, let's talk about the pan that we're gonna use. If you don't have a Dutch oven or a cast iron, you can use a regular pot, sure. It's not gonna be the end of the world. Just make sure it has a lid, something that is going to seal all of the juices and steam everything in here. We're gonna start fat side down. Ooh. That's exactly what you wanna hear. You don't wanna crowd the pan, but this was the smallest Dutch oven that I had running up. So we're gonna push the limits a little bit. The reason why I like using a cast iron Dutch oven is actually because the way it retains its heat. It is so thick walled that it will heat up, stay heated, and then insulate it as well in the oven for one nice consistent cook. It's exactly what we're looking for. Lowering this down just a bit because I can literally smell that my beef is cooking a little too quickly. I do want that browning to happen. I'm looking for that Maillard reaction, that caramelization of proteins, but I don't want any brown bitterness. Awesome. We're gonna give these a few minutes on each side. In the meantime, we're gonna talk about some vegetables. We're gonna talk about some mise en place for a second. First and foremost, something that I found incredibly easy and that could save you a ton of time is that we have some freshness guaranteed with the great value brand of Walmart and you can actually get your onions pre-sliced. Further than that, you can actually get your entire mise en place pre-sliced, your carrots, your celery, your onion, everything is going to come pre-wrapped and sliced fresh daily, freshness guaranteed from Walmart. Saves you a ton of time, not to mention a ton of money. On top of that, if you're really trying to save a ton of time, Walmart 
even has an app where you can order everything straight through there and then get all that delivered straight to your home. You don't even have to leave your house for this comfort food of a meal. Everything can be done straight at home from the app, from your kitchen. It doesn't get better than that. Especially when you got those lazy Sundays and you really don't want to move or do anything. I got a little bit of color in here, a little bit of browning. I want a little bit more. Pro tip, this would go a little bit quicker if we weren't crowding our pan as much. The reason being here is that we are releasing a bunch of moisture and now the moisture doesn't really have as much room to escape because there's not as much surface area on the bottom. So we have a little bit of moisture building up on the bottom. It's not a big deal. We're still going to get that beautiful brown bits. It just may take a little bit longer. Back to our mirepoix. Celery is quite important. I'm using, again, the Organic Marketplace, great value brand, celery. You can pick it straight up from the store. Cutting off the bottoms here, we don't waste anything. Save these. There should be a little, a little plastic bag in your fridge of all of your vegetable scraps. And at the end of the month, you can make a great vegetable stock or a chicken stock that you can fortify other sauces and dishes and stuff like that, or even use for your short ribs in the future. So don't throw anything away. Just because I'm cutting it off doesn't mean it's going into a garbage, right? I'm going to do the tops as well. Not that they don't taste great. I just don't like the way they look. So that'll also be for stock. I'm going to split these ribs right down the middle. And then we are going to just run a knife straight across them like this. Looking for about quarter inch cubes or so, whatever that looks like. But before I finish that off, let's check on these ribs one more time. There we go. That's what we're looking for. So now you can flip your ribs in an awkward position. There it is. Look at that. Great coloring. Beautiful. We're layering flavor here, okay? That's why we want to brown off all of these bits. We're creating a fond on the bottom of our pan that later when we reintroduce some moisture-filled vegetables or even some liquid like a wine or a stock, it is going to pick up the fond, all the brown bits from the bottom of the pan, and add that to the sauce itself. Again, just running a knife through this uh, celery here. Now, when you have a mise en place, it's supposed to be about 50% onion, and then 25% carrots, and 25% celery. But it's cooking, so there's no real rules. It's not like baking. So if you prefer more onion, less onion, you can subtract the two. Let me break it down to you like this, right? Onions are really for your aromatic. You're going to get a lot of uh, personality from those onions, from garlic and stuff like that, right? The carrots, that's where your sweetness is coming from. Yes, you're going to get a little bit of carrot taste from it. Sure, it's inevitable. But we really want to pull out all those sugars from the carrots. And those are really going to caramelize and roast and give a nice sweetness to the base. The celery, on the other hand, the celery is for freshness. So you get this beautiful bite this vegetal quality this fresh quality so you can kind of play with that ratio with whatever you're making and be your own chef there and make your own decision but for this recipe we're going to stick with the classic 50 25 25 all the way to the end here just like that this is a big board. I'm just going to keep it all on the board so you guys don't see me pull out any tricks. None of that as seen on TV stuff, right? Beautiful. Beautiful. Look at that browning right there, that Maillard reaction. Flip it again. Remember, we got four sides here. Love it. What's next? Carrots. Got some beautiful, great value carrots here. I like using baby carrots. Why? It's less cutting that I need to do. Rather than if I had a giant carrot that I have to carve up and do a bunch of different places. Way easier doing it this way. So I, there's no shame into taking the baby carrots. I'm going to take a few. I want to make sure you'll be able to see this on the board, right? Cool, cool. And again, same thing. We want everything to cook at the same rate. So you want everything to be about the same size. So if we went about a quarter of an inch here with our celery, I also want to go a quarter of an inch with our carrot. Let's see how Freshness Guaranteed did. Look at that. We're right in the money. Those pre-cut, beautiful. Everything's going to be right around the same size. It's just what we're looking for. Consistent cooking, lovely. It's also going to make you look like a professional when your guest pulls out a spoonful of all of that mirepoix on the bottom, right? They're going to say, wow, this guy took his time. 
he knows what he's doing. He saw a Taste Made Walmart video and learned everything he knows. Yeah, probably. We're going to do a few more handfuls of these. I love it here, guys. I absolutely love braised short ribs. Fall and winter, by far, goes without saying. Best season for food, right? Best season for cooking food. If you want to go out to a restaurant or if you don't really want to cook much food, spring and summer, of course, are superior because it's a lot of fresh vegetables, right? Not a lot that really needs to be done. Let the food kind of speak for itself. But man, I really don't mind turning on my oven or my stove in the fall or the winter time, making something like beef shanks, short ribs. Oh gosh, lamb shanks are amazing. Pulled lamb shoulder, right? Any of those low and slow braises, they got me all over it for sure. We uh we actually have served perfect. See, the other reason why I like leaving it out is because you can kind of visually see that's half and that's half. They look about equal. You can even serve short ribs on Christmas Day. We've done it before. Beautiful. These short ribs are perfect. So again, one last one last time. Beautiful Maillard reaction. That caramelization of proteins. I'm gonna put these back here on the same sheet tray we started on. Get one more right in here. You see all the fond sitting on the bottom of my pan here like this? We're gonna pick all this up right now, watch, right? So I got our mirepoix going in, onions. Onions, vegetables, all this stuff. There's a ton of moisture in there, right? So by adding all of this, it's about to release a bunch of moisture, pick up all the little brown bits on the bottom of your pan and get them working in that sauce. A spoon. A spoon, excellent. Move all these guys around. Here's another tip. I'm really not a big fan of pre-seasoning or seasoning as you go along, right? But when you're trying to roast out some vegetables, just to give them a little extra help, I give them a little bit of salt to help sweat along. This is gonna help bring out some moisture to help these cook a little bit quicker. Sweat, baby, sweat. That needs to be a candle. Walmart, call me. Let's set this up. That should be a candle. Braised short ribs in general should really be its own scent, to be honest. When your house smells like you've been cooking short ribs, whew, there's nothing better than that. All right. What else we got moving on over here? So coming in next is going to be our tomato paste. Tomato paste to me for this recipe is crucial. For a few reasons. You could add crushed tomatoes if you had them. If you don't have tomato paste, sure. You can add some crushed tomatoes. You can add a little bit of tomato juice or tomato sauce canned if you want it as well. The real thing that we're searching for is the acidity and the sweetness. The sweetness combined, right, with all of these vegetables in the beginning at this stage is going to help further caramelize all of those flavors. There's a lot of sweetness in tomatoes. There's also some acidity. So I don't want to blow out my cameras here with all this, uh, all this steam coming off here. There's also some acidity. So the acidity is also going to help break down these vegetables a little bit more. It also adds a beautiful body and base to our short rib sauce. So a fun little trick. I'm using, of course, great value tomato, so, uh, tomato paste here. I cut the top and the bottom off for a little cheat code, you can just push it up right like that. No problem. We're looking for about a tablespoon or so. It's about a tablespoon. Come right in like this. It's still a little bit frozen. That wasn't a tablespoon. That's a tablespoon. Cool. Throw this lid right back on. If you're using it the rest of the day or even for tomorrow, you can leave it just like this or plop it out onto the little plate, pop it in your freezer so it solidifies. You could take it right off, put it in a little baggie or wrap it in plastic wrap, 
and you're good to go for months. Seriously. Awesome. So let's mix all this together. You want everything to get really caramelized, right? When you are, when I was working in restaurants and anytime we would make like nice, deep, rich sauces or um, a few of the mother sauces would actually include a base much like this as well. We would take a bunch of root vegetables. We'd roast them off in the oven, including some onions and some celery as well. Kind of like a loose uh, mir mirepoix that we got going on. Once they've coated a little bit, cooked a little bit, and they're a little tender, take them out, toss them in tomato paste, throw them back in there. That's known as a pinsage. That's sort of what we're doing right here in this pan. Awesome. So again, guys, not too much seasoning here, right? Just a little bit with the vegetables, just to get that stuff going a little bit, sweat out just a hair. Um, I primarily like to season my everything, actually, not just short ribs. I season everything at the end of the dish. The reason being is you want to be able to maintain the seasoning throughout the dish. Sometimes when things cook longer, it gets a little bit more intense if you added salt early on. So I want things, especially if they're going to have a longer cook, to kind of just come together as they need. And then at the end, give it a taste. Where am I on the palate, right? The most important tool in the kitchen is going to be your palate. Do I need more acid? Do I need more fat? Do we just need a little bit of salt to brighten up that vegetal quality and bring it to the front of our palates? Whatever it may be, a little bit of pepper. If you like spicy foods, all right, one more thing. If you like spicy foods, you could add a little bit of chili flakes right now into this. This is going to help layer those flavors, but forewarning, if you add it in now, it won't be a immediate heat as soon as you take a bite. It'll be one of those things that you take a bite, you take a sip back, and it's sitting right here on the back of your palate way after that you have swallowed. If you want to layer your heat like that and make it that intense, now would be the time to add that. Beautiful. So this stuff is caramelizing along great here. Look at that. You see everything picked up off the bottom as well? Beautiful. Didn't even have to add liquid. We didn't have to uh, clear that pan with like a stock or anything like that. There was enough moisture in our vegetables to be able to pull all that stuff right out. Awesome. So we're getting there. A few more things that I want to add here. We have some beautiful dried wild mushrooms. Forgot what this is a mix of. I was trying to think, oh, what kind of wild mushrooms? They're just wild mushrooms. So normally, if you were going to use these wild mushrooms, you would want to give them a rinse once or twice and then rehydrate them. These are very, very clean, as you can see. Like this is our porcini, and our porcini is stark white. So I'm going to assume that these were actually not wild, just a wild variety. And they may have been done in a hydroponic, you know, facility, something like that, when things are brought in like that. And that's just how they do it. So rather than rehydrating this, I'm actually just going to add them straight into here and let the moisture and juices absorb into these dried mushrooms. I almost want osmosis to kind of take place there. So we're going straight in there with all these nice little mushroom bits. They'll hydrate and get nice and big while they're in here. Toss this around. Mmm. So good. Now, listen, you could totally use fresh mushrooms if you wanted to. Um, here's the thing with mushrooms. When people cook mushrooms, and maybe this is just a pet peeve of mine personally, who knows? But when people cook mushrooms and serve me mushrooms, no one ever cooks mushrooms all the way. Mushrooms have a lot of moisture. They're like a sponge. In order to get that intense, earthy mushroom taste, you need to take them about four minutes past when you think they're probably finished. That's just what I've picked up in my experiences. Um, if that was the case, I would have started, believe it or not, with the mushrooms. I would have went beef, take the beef out, maybe some of the fat as well, just because we don't want too much in these mushrooms, right? Then add the mushrooms, sweat them out, really get them roasted, take them out as well, and then start this process with our mirepoix, our tomato paste, and all that other stuff. Just because I do want them cooked, I, I, I want some flavor on those mushrooms. It's a lot like our beef. We took the time to brown off our beef, caramelize the outside, get a nice flavor layer going down, right? Why wouldn't we do that with an ingredient like mushrooms? We're doing it with ingredients like carrots and the rest of our mirepoix, where we really want to caramelize and sweat these out. So do your mushrooms the same justice and put them in first if you're using fresh. Now, 
I personally like to do drive because that saves me a bunch of time not having to do any of that sort of stuff. Also, dried mushrooms are super intense with flavor. I would take like one slice of a dried mushroom against one whole regular uh, mushroom before you slice it in terms of like flavor capacity. It is that much concentrated in a dried mushroom rather than doing it from a fresh mushroom. Dried mushrooms all day. Beautiful. So we got this going. I got a little pinch of time. This was for my original recipe. This is too much. We are only going to do one bay leaf and we're probably only going to do about half of this time here. Ooh. Go for pieces that are all one piece, right? That way you're not fishing out branches later. Awesome. Immediately, you get the herbs, you get that smell of the thyme. The oils are, are, are rubbing off of that thyme and it's just flooding my kitchen right now. It doesn't get any better than that. We're coming in with a little bit of red wine. Again, half recipe, not gonna use all this. We had some uh, company over on Sunday. So that was literally just a leftover bottle of red wine. If you ever have a bottle open that maybe you only needed a little bit for cooking, or maybe you only took a glass out and fell asleep or something, because let's face it, that happens all the time, right? Put a cork in it, throw it in the bottom of your fridge. It's going to be good for a few weeks, no problem, at least for cooking wine. It isn't going to have that same tannic and alcohol uh, effect as normal if you were to drink it. Um, it's going to be a little bit funkier because it's going to have some time to ferment being exposed to air now at this point, once that core comes out, but it makes for perfect cooking wine. So instead of making a sin and having to open up a bottle next time you're cooking your short ribs, you have it already done. Amazing. Only going to cook this out for about 60 seconds. I wanna dry the wine out just a little bit, but I still want some juice in there. We're gonna come in with about three cloves of garlic. I'm leaving them whole. I'm not smashing them. I'm not chopping them. When you leave garlic whole like this, it's going to have more of a sweeter taste than it would an astringent taste or a harsh, aggressive taste with some heat. Most important step. How are you going to forget that, right? Let's get these short ribs back into the party. So we're just going to nestle these guys right in here like this. Everybody find your little home. There you go. If you get a short rib like this, right, where the bone is on top and the big fat stack is on the bottom like this, right, I want this side down so that if the whole thing isn't fully submerged, I don't have meat sticking out. I only have bone sticking out, right? Just like that. Now I'm going to come in with none other than the great value, unsalted beef broth. Whenever I'm using stock, whenever I'm using things like butters and stuff like that. I always go for unsalted. Why? Well, we've kind of answered that a few times already. By not imparting salt at these steps, we'll have more control of the solidity and the salt later on. So again, we will just season at the end. We just want these to be covered. Beautiful. So cover it with your broth or stock. Honestly, I don't know why I keep preferring to it as broth. Um, so really the difference when you're buying beef broth or beef stock or any type of beef versus stock, stock is something that you are going to be adding things to. So it is just meant to be a liquid, a base, if you will, for other stocks or other soups or a base as a sauce versus beef broth is ready as is. So if you were feeling lazy and you were throwing together a last minute soup or something like that, adding the beef broth and only letting it simmer for like 20 minutes versus letting it go for a few hours, broth would be your best bet over the stock. But personally, I like the, the character in some stock. It's not like as finished as you would think, you know, if that makes sense. So everything is covered here beautifully. <laughs> Always one important trick. You'll catch me doing it all the time in my videos. Look at your station. Look at your mise en place, right? 
you took the time ahead of this recipe to read all of the ingredients and make sure you took everything out so it was ready to rock. Everything should be here. Take a look to see if you missed anything, to see if you skipped something. Even I do it. It happens sometimes, especially when you're in the heat in the moment, making something as beautiful like this. Everything is in here. I didn't skip anything, so that's good news. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop that off, take our lid, <coughs> pop our lid right in here so it's nice and stuck. We're going straight into an oven, 375 degrees for about three hours. So time and temperature, right? The lower the time, no, sorry. The lower the temperature, the longer the time that it usually will have to be. If you are pressed for time, you can reduce those two things until they meet in some sort of common area, right? So you can easily cook these short ribs for eight hours at 300 degrees. No problem. They're going to be delicious. Slowly braising and everything. Amazing. All of those flavors just concentrating and getting super complex. Fantastic. I wouldn't go higher than 375. It's a little aggressive to be braising anything at 400 plus degrees. Um, I know some of you will argue, well, what about pressure cookers? That's another story. That's another science. That's another seal where we're not letting steam escape and other things like bacteria. Wow. Once that kind of shuts off, you can hear me a little better. I didn't mean to be shouting at you. Um, so that would totally be fine too. But what I like personally, the 375 for three hours is that sweet spot. Um, for the final... 20 minutes of that three hours, take the lid off, take a look at what's going on inside, right? If it still looks like there's a ton of liquid left, maybe you were a little heavy handed, maybe you screwed up. It's not a big deal. If there's a lot of liquid left and we're looking to reduce that down into a sauce, take the lid off, pop it back in that 375 oven for about another 20 to 30 minutes. The open lid is now going to allow um, evaporation and steam to escape from the top, as well as aggressive heat reducing the liquid that is now inside. So that's basically all you gotta do for short ribs, guys. That took literally 20, 25 minutes to get all that going. Would probably take you less time if you weren't listening to me babble the entire time. Would even take you less time if you shopped at Walmart, got those low prices, and got that mise en place pre-cut vegetables freshness guaranteed. It doesn't get any easier. I'm not going to give you a mashed, uh, a short rib recipe without giving you a mashed potato recipe. So let's dive into some mashed potatoes. In this pot, I have a little bit of great value. See, look, I practice what I preach. We have unsalted butter here. And then I also have some great value whole milk as well. We're going to melt this down. Helps if you turn it on, man. What? One second, guys. One second. <laughs> One of the issues with working with induction like this, not all pots are created equal. So my induction burner does not want to agree with this pot. It's totally all fine. We'll move to a stainless steel one. Look at that. She's not shouting at me anymore. Awesome. Great question. Question just popped up in the chat. What if you don't have beef stock? You already have some stock. Can you just use things you already have? Absolutely. Uh, vegetable stock would go great here. I hope this doesn't bite me for saying this. You can use chicken stock, but chicken stock and beef stock are not interchangeable. I don't want to say that where you think, oh, Matt said I can just use chicken stock in place of beef stock. I'm making a beef sauce. I can just use chicken stock. No, you can't. We are doing a braise in here, right? When you think about it, the amount of stock that we put in there really wasn't that much. Yes, it is going to impart some flavor, but it is not going to rule everything that's going on in here. Ooh, that's scary. This was too hot. We have red wine in there. Very tannic. It's going to uh, take over a lot of things that are going in here, right? And then we also have all of the juice from the vegetables and stuff as well. So with that, with the beef fat that is also cooking out and concentrating in this braise, you're really not going to taste chicken stock in this dish. When you are braising, it is okay to use other types of stocks other than the protein you are using, as long as it's not fish, okay? Okay. So my induction burner is trying to tell me, hey, man, you're done here. We're 100% melted. This is nice and steamy. I'm going to pop it on the back burner. I'm going to shut this off so you can hear me better. And we're going to go into 
making mashed potatoes because it's that easy. Oh, before I forget, there's a key part for this mashed potatoes. I'm gonna give you a secret of mine. I like adding some freshness, right? To our mashed potatoes. So I have here some great value green onions. We're just gonna take a few of these. Shut you off. That's all I gotta do. So we got some green onions. I just wanna give this a light, a, a light slice here. Nothing crazy. So if you cut these off and they still have roots like this, my mother says that you can put them in a little bit of water in a cup on your windowsill and they will eventually actually grow back. It's one of those rare uh, greens that will actually do that. There's a big argument about good, okay, terrible. That's not true. It's vegetable. There's a right place for everything, right? We have a little bag going on right here with all of our vegetable scraps. So we'll no problem at the end of the month be able to use anything that we're not using today. Even if I decide not to regrow these guys in my kitchen, I can also easily put this in a stock as well. This is a little bit more aggressive. This, where it's starting to get a little bit more green, is a little fresher. And then sometimes people say that these get a little stale and they have a weird consistency and a chew, uh, maybe a little woody, like an asparagus, if you will, fibrous. But nonetheless, I digress. I disagree with all that. I think the entire thing is okay. I'll be honest, I'm only going to cut to about up to here, but then the rest of it isn't going into a stock bag. It's just going into another bag that I can still use fresh green onions whenever I need. Also, if you did, and this was all you had, you can totally use this for what we're about to do because we are putting it in steaming hot mashed potatoes. That would break that down and kind of slightly cook it. Awesome. Beautiful. And we'll do a little more. So of course, if we were doing everything all at once, it would take a while for these potatoes to be cooking. So I already have my potatoes cooked. The biggest trick that I would like to tell you guys about cooking potatoes. Potatoes are very special as they have something inside of them that can naturally make them creamy without actually having to add dairy or much dairy at all, right? We already have in here our milk, our butter cooking. If you don't have milk, you can easily use cream, no problem. Either is a little interchangeable. It's just going to taste a little richer. There's more butter, fat, and cream than there is in milk. But I like the mix of whole milk and butter that we have in here right now. Um, but again, either is totally fine. You can even do a little bit of both worlds. You can do a little butter. You can do a little milk. No problem. The main thing is that these potatoes have a ton of starch inside of them, right? That starch isn't like a gross, starchy pasta water starch. It's a creamy, delicious, flavorful starch that we actually want to preserve. And the biggest misconception when people cook potatoes is that they boil the crap out of them until they're falling apart in the pot. Big no-no. And they also peel them. Listen, I'm not trying to say that you have to peel your potatoes, but by pe peeling your potatoes or piercing the skin of a potato, you are now allowing water to get inside of the potato and wash out all of that flavor. It's probably not something you think about a lot when you're making mashed potatoes on how you're treating or cooking the potato itself. Oh, I'm just going to strain them, mash them, add a bunch of good fattening stuff, and they're going to be delicious. Yeah, sure. But they may not taste a lot like potatoes. So if you really want to stretch, not stretch, if you really want to accentuate that potato taste, you're like, oh my gosh, these potatoes are incredible. How are they so whipped? Well, it's not because I added two sticks of butter to them, which I kind of want to, but I'm not going to. It's because I reserved that potato flavor by not boiling it out, right? Also, if you, so again, I would leave them whole. I wouldn't cut them. I would always shoot for buying smaller potatoes rather than buying larger potatoes where you would have to cut into them to expose their flesh, to have them all the same uniform size so they cook at the same rate. I get it. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. If you were to do that, maybe throw them in a low oven, maybe around 250, 275 on a sheet tray for about 30 minutes. We want to dry them out a little bit. Okay. We don't want, it's not going to preserve the starch. We already got out rid of the starch when we boiled the crap out of them. It's okay. But if you still want to save them and still make them somewhat creamy on what we're doing right now in this method, you can extract some of that moisture that you already imparted during your boiling process. 
um, by drying them out a little bit in the oven. It's a good tip. Or if you're me, buy little potatoes. Don't boil them, simmer them. And when they're done, they're done. Just like that. See, you can squish them. I was worried that that was going to make a mess, but it didn't. So where's my mapina? Mapina down because I really like this cutting board and I don't want to ruin it. Now we have a bunch of, let me wash the spoon really quick. So we got our free cooked potatoes here. We are just going to smash them a little bit, right? Don't worry about getting them perfect in all little pearl shapes or all the same crust shapes or anything like that. Once we add this hot liquid, it's just gonna melt everything together. So I'm just kind of literally, whoop, I'm just taking the flat end of a, uh, and we're pressing down like this. See, see? And they're just smush, easy. I mean, honestly, if you got kids, I'm sure kids would love to grab them with their hands and squish them in their hands like that, right? I'm a hands-on guy myself. So as long as your hands are clean, you could totally get in there and even squeeze them with your hands. All these are perfectly cooked. Wow, great job. And uh, they're gonna come together great. There's a lot of nutrients. There's a lot of flavor in the potato. So I wanna reserve that. I don't wanna get rid of all of that kind of good stuff, right? But if you are, you know, you can't get mini potatoes and you have russet potatoes and you do peel your potatoes, you know what I'm going to say. Don't get rid of your peels. Why would you get rid of your peels? There's so much flavor in those peels. No waste, guys. You can either throw them straight into your stock. I know a lot of you guys are probably saying gross. It's going to make it really starchy. All right, I got one better for you. Throw it on a sheet tray. Put it in a low oven. Again, literally like 175, 200. Very, very low. And leave it in there overnight. You are slowly going to evaporate any moisture in there and concentrate all of those flavors. Believe it or not, it won't be as starchy pale water when you add them when you are building your stock later. They'll be perfect. They'll be aromatic. They'll be beautiful. And it's going to add a nice layer to your stock. It's also going to add some color to your stock, which should be nice, right? So again, just making sure all of these are smashed up, which they are. I'm going to add our hot milk and our hot cream. Hot milk and hot butter, not cream. You got me. And I had a whisk somewhere. Here we are. I'm going to whisk all this together. Again, I'm using my, there we go. My whisk to kind of mash things up a little bit more if I have to. I picked the largest pot to be doing this small amount in. It's okay. All you got to do is tilt it up. So everything, so when I tilt it up like this, everything is kind of coming down this way, right? So now it's easier to mash and whisk just this contents rather than trying to whisk everything on a flatter, broader surface. If you have a potato mill or masher or anything like that, feel free to use it. I don't like doing dishes. So if I can make another tool do the same thing. <laughs> awesome. All right. Mix these up. Nice, chunky potatoes. Now, as you see, as I'm moving them around, we're getting some, some nice starchiness expelling from them, right? Beautiful. That starch is coming out. It's infusing with that butter and we're getting these nice whipped potatoes. Awesome. We are going to add all of these, almost all of these green onions in. I'm gonna leave like a tablespoon for Justin, just in case. Justin's also our cameraman. Whisk this all up. Come in with some more salt. Generous amount of salt. As I'm sure you guys know, potatoes do need a lot of salt. There we go. We'll start with a little bit, taste it, and see how we go. I'm also gonna come up with a little, little peps. Cool. A spoon to taste. Immediately you get those green onions, amazing. Awesome, super. Creamy, delicious, 
mashed potatoes, guys. Awesome. Needs a little bit more salt. Notice they're not like gummy or runny or anything like that. If the, your potatoes got gummy, it's probably because they got cold. Do this while everything is hot. It is going to prevent your potatoes from getting gross and gummy. Also, haha, don't use oil and don't use margarine. Use butter. And what do we do? We taste. Those are delicious. You ready to plate her up? Let's do it. So we're going to get ourselves a nice little bowl here. We're going to grab a spoon. We're going to grab our nice mashed potatoes, creamy, delicious, little chunky. And I like to make like a little bed here. Oh, you can't see. I like to make a little bed on the bottom where I'm gonna run sauce and all that other yumminess right over it. Kick this on the back burner because I wanna show you something I've been working on, guys. Oh, yes. Look at those little babies. Wow. So I'm gonna use my hands because I'm a hands on guy. Look at this, look how beautiful and tender these short ribs just pull right apart, guys. Oh, look at that. The smell, red wine permeating everything. It's fantastic. You see this on the bottom, what we did? Look at our mirepoix, how it's all caramelized. It's almost like a paste. Beautiful, oh, beautiful, you got our Herbs right here, we can pull right out. Bay leaf is big enough. I'm not worried about it. I'll find her later. Let's wash this. Give this a quick rinse. Let's get the largest short rib ever. Hey. Plate you just like that. Some, some veggies as well in there. See that? Woo! Our sauce is, it's not thick, thick, but it's not runny. So if you wanted this to be thick, you got two options here. Doing that idea that I said a little bit earlier, I only did it for about 10 minutes because my uh, moisture, my liquid level was quite low already, so I wasn't worried about it, right? And then the second option would be taking out all the short ribs and taking out maybe a cup or two of our vegetables of all of this yummy stuff right here. And then a little bit of the liquid as well. And then pureeing this and then adding it to the liquid to kind of like thicken and fortify our, our, our sauce. So if you're into a little bit of a thicker sauce, that's your, that's your key. That's your way to go. So we are back. I think this may be the best view for y'all, right? Right on here like that. A few things I want to finish this up with. You could take toasted breadcrumbs would be really nice. Maybe a little fresh parsley also be beautiful. I like to take some lemon zest. Just a few rasps, nothing crazy. You have all of these unctuous flavors going on, all these rich, fatty flavors on your palate. We want to break it up a little bit. I don't want to add acid, but I want to brighten it up a little bit using a little lemon zest, okay? And then remember those, uh, those green onions that we sliced from the first act? They're making a double appearance here. And we're coming right on top like that. Let me get a four. Because I got I to gotta have these. I got to try these. Oh, they smell amazing. And that lemon, you're getting it fragrant. It, as soon as it hits the hot short ribs, it just pops. Amazing. Oh, my God. Fall off the bone. Forget about it. Beef short ribs, guys. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. Salt, perfect. And we barely seasoned it, really. 
Salt is perfect. Those mashed potatoes are fantastic. I got these nice rustic cut vegetables here. Love it. I love being able to see what I'm eating, right? Look at that. Now we get this nice little, nice little harmony of the sauce and the mashed potatoes. Oh man, I'm only supposed to taste it, but I want to finish this entire thing right now. That's going to be dinner. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been so much fun. I'm happy that you guys got to hang out with me, learn how to make one of the easiest and affordable meals, period. I like, I swear to you. I know the recipe calls for six short ribs total. I went to the store today. They were packaging them in fours. So I got eight short ribs all together with the exception of the wine and maybe some olive oil and a few things that I already had laying around in my pantry. I was able to spend less than $40 on eight portions of short ribs. It's less than $6 a, short, uh, a, a plate. It's incredible. All thanks to Walmart. It doesn't get any better. And don't forget, you can always order right from that app, have everything delivered straight to your home. You don't even have to leave your house. It's that simple. Their delivery is perfect. And I don't know what else to tell you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for Tastemade for having me. Walmart, it's been a pleasure. And we'll see you soon, guys. Matthew from The Art of Eating. Take care.